Let our response be verse 4 of O Little Town of Bethlehem. Our Lord invites us to come to him. He enjoys nothing more than a heart that is open to him and desires him. He brings us new life in the spirit and rescues us from all our sins. This is the good news of Jesus the Christ, born of Mary. He is for us and not against us. Let us come to him in this season in joy and renewal accepting his love and comfort, which he is ready and eager to restore on all who desire a right relationship with him. Amen. Let hills 
Bells and veils ring to the song that he sing. Blessed be the hour. Welcome the morn for Christ our dear Savior. On earth now is born. All through the night, angels did sing their carols so sweet. Thank you, Brian, for all the beautiful music you have given us during this Advent season. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from the fifth chapter of Micah, the ruler from Bethlehem. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God." And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. And from Luke's Gospel, the story of Mary visiting Elizabeth. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me? that the mother of my Lord comes to me. For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with, with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy 
according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. The Gospel of our Lord praise to you, Lord Christ. I want to ask you a question, she said. As I walked toward the corner of 17th and Castellar Streets in Omaha, I was handing out flyers for our kids' night at Castellar Presbyterian when I served for two years there as temporary supply. She was one of the preteen girls we'd seen a couple of times at our youth night. I want to ask you a question, she said. I greeted her by name and said I'd be happy to answer her question. Let's walk up the street together, for I needed to speak to her mother anyway. She was pretty, blonde, rosy-cheeked in the cold air, with an intense look about her eyes. What did you want to ask, I encouraged her. Her question took my breath away. She dropped her voice as we walked. I dreamed that Jesus came to my house last night. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, she asked. In this final week of the Advent season, a sense of mystery descends upon the scene. It begins with the telling of a mystical experience that happens to a teenage girl simply minding her own business in an obscure Jewish village in an insignificant part of the Roman Empire. And the hinge of human history hangs here, in that place, at that time. Medieval artists perhaps picture it best. I like the painting where Mary is seated and without warning a breeze seems to be ruffling the pages of her ancient prayer book. She looks up to meet and become lost in the gaze of the archangel Gabriel. He announces to Mary the unthinkable, the unimaginable, the incarnation. The writer of the book of Hebrews was to exclaim, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Look at Jonah and the whale. Look at Paul, blinded on the road to Damascus. Look at you and at me. And imagine how this fearfulness must have been multiplied in Mary. In her days, the rabbis had set the minimum age for marriage at 12 for girls and 13 for boys. The whole concept of what we know as adolescence was unheard of in that time. When nature determined that Jewish children were ready to marry and have a family, marriage took place. And our own planned progress of high school and college and perhaps graduate school would have been absolutely inconceivable in Jesus' time. And in a world like ours that understands the blessings of God, usually in terms of financial gain, things like getting a good job or simply having good health or adding to our material wealth in some way with a new house, a car, or updated technological things, it's hard for us to understand how favored or blessed Mary might have been. How blessed, after all, could it have been for her to be pregnant with no human father to share the blame in a community which regarded promiscuity with utter distaste and horror? How favored could she have been to have a son whom her hometown folk later spoke of 
in accordance with Mark's gospel as having gone out of his mind. How fortunate would it have made her feel to watch her son be repudiated by Jerusalem's leadership and called a blasphemer and then watch him die inch by terrible inch on the cross? I dreamed Jesus came to my house last night, she spoke. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? The religious essayist Madeleine Langla was to write, what would have happened to Mary and the rest of us if she had said no to the angel? Even then, she had the freedom to run. In our time, she could have asked for more time to decide. Or like us, she could have wanted to talk it over with significant people in her life and then get back to God in a less stressful time. Or simply, her mind glazed over with shock, make no decision at all. And yet, and yet, an ordinary girl says yes to God and becomes the means of grace for the healing of the world and for us. An ordinary girl finds it in her heart to say yes, and her song rings through the ages. Someone has written this contemporary Magnificat, and I share it with you this morning. My heart is bubbling over with joy. With God, it is good to be woman. From now on, let all people proclaim it is a wonderful gift to be. The one in whom power truly rests has lifted us up to praise. God's goodness shall fall like a spring shower on the trusting of every age. The disregarded have been raised up. The pompous and the powerful shall fall. God has feasted the empty-bellied, and the rich have discovered their void. God has made good the word given at the dawn of time. The song that is to come, the Magnificat of Mary, is one of the most joyful of the Christmas season. Yet it's ironic that the words of the Christmas story that we're about to celebrate also contain some of the saddest words ever written. There was no room for them in the inn. Or in the prologue to John's Gospel, we read, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. No room at the inn. His people received him not. Sad and ironic words for the birth of a Savior. But Mary has room in her heart for Jesus, and we celebrate her this Sunday. Earlier in the Advent season, we sang the hymn with the refrain, O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, There is room in my heart for thee. Were there ever more appropriate words penned for an Advent or Christmas hymn? For Mary does have room in her heart. And so she becomes a model for each and every one of us on this day. A woman, a very young woman, was the first to hear the announcement that God is with us. The first to believe the good news the first to receive him in her heart. And through Mary, we remember we are never too small or weak or insignificant for God not to care about us, not to know our name. And wherever you are at this time in the world, God knows who you are. God knows what you are experiencing And the great news of the gospel for this season is you are never alone. I dreamed that Jesus came to my house last night, she said. 
So now we remember that through him we are bound to one another. We are joined with one another, dependent on one another, as members of one great tribe. And with Mary, we stand expectantly at Hope's window, and with Frederick Beekner's words, we pray, Lord, catch us off guard today. Surprise us with some moment of beauty or pain, so that for at least a moment, we may be startled into seeing that you are with us here in all your splendor, always, everywhere, barely hidden beneath within this life we breathe. And so on this final Sunday of Advent, we remember that in Jesus, our deepest longings are met, and we pray that we too may magnify our Lord and God with joy. May that joy be yours on this day, in this season, and in this holy night to come. And may we stand expectantly with Mary at Hope's window, singing with joy for all the days to come in the memory and the glory of his holy name. Amen and amen.